excited to have you all join our session today on creative ways to use social annotation in your courses. Uh, I do know it takes everyone a minute or so to join the Zoom webinar. Uh, so I will uh, just wait another minute um, or so uh, for um, all of our registrants to join and then I'll kick, officially kick things off. Um, Let's go ahead and kick things off and then, of course, A-OK -okay if anyone joins us last minute. Um, I'll officially introduce myself. I'm Becky George from the Hypothesis Success Team. Uh, joining you all from uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, where um, it's starting to, to feel like fall. Um, uh, the leaves are starting to turn, getting a little chilly. Um, so quite a, quite a sudden shift for us in the southeast here. Um, uh, excited to be working with you all today. Um, I am joined by um, several of my colleagues as well. They've thrown some introductions in the chat. Um, so um, the the hypothesis success team is is here to to help support you. Um, so any questions that you have, feel free to throw those in the chat during today's session, um, and we'd all be happy to to help answer those. Um, I'm also going to go ahead and put a link to the slide deck in the chat. So that you have that. Um, just so you know, outside of today's session, uh, I will follow up uh, and share a recording to the session as well as the slide deck again. So don't worry about having to access those resources. No need to memorize anything we talk about. You'll have um, those resources to come back to outside of today's session. And if you haven't already um, thrown an introduction in the chat, we'd love to hear from you. Um, as you know, um, hopefully you're in the right place and, and you're hoping to be in the session on creative ways to use social annotation in your courses. Um, that will be the focus, um, the primary focus of today's session, but I am gonna just start off by doing a brief introduction of the tool. I know we have a range of, of folks joining us today. Some of you who are brand new to Hypothesis, maybe a limited background, and some of you may be more experienced users. Um, so I'm gonna just start off by talking about what we sometimes refer to as our motto, and that Hypothesis helps make reading more active, more visible, and more social. Um, more active in the sense that you and your students have a place to anchor your thoughts and ideas. As we know, it's easy to be a distracted reader, especially when looking at digital text. So a hypothesis gives you and your students a place um, to write their thoughts, um, actively engage with the text. Hypothesis is also a great tool for making reading more visible, more visible uh, to the reader themselves while they're reading, but also more visible to you, the instructor, as well. Um, I'm sure we've all been in a, uh, a course meeting, whether that was virtual or in person, where you ask a question about text that perhaps students were supposed to read in preparation of the course meeting, and you get those blank stares, awkward silence. Did they not do the reading? Do they not understand the reading? What questions do they have? Nobody's willing to raise their hand, right? I think we've all been in that situation before. So this gives you and your students um, some insight, um, gives you insight into students' thoughts and understandings that you otherwise wouldn't have. Uh, and then particularly near and dear to our hearts at Hypothesis is that it's a social annotation tool. So those thoughts, those questions, those light bulb moments that students are have, having in the text are no longer just visible to themselves as if they were annotating a paper copy of the text, uh, but you and your students can create a collaborative learning environment on top of the text with it being a social annotation tool. Uh, it may seem a bit premature for these resources, but I did want to just let you know that these are here for you to come back to. Um, some great resources, both for you as well as for your students. Uh, this first one here, um, Annotation Etiquette for Students, is great tips for students. Less about using the tool and more about um, how to create meaningful annotations. Uh, second one goes through the different annotation types. Um, multimedia can be a great way to have your students um, give your students choice in how they're responding to the text. So we have a resource here on adding images, videos, and links to your annotations. We actually do um, also host a uh, workshop specifically on using multimedia in annotations. Uh, so I'll just put a link to all of our partner workshops that are coming up this fall in the chat. Uh, so if you are interested in learning about multimedia or other topics that we offer this fall, you can take a look at those sessions, and we'd love to have you join us at another upcoming session. 
Um, we're slowly but surely collating resources from our partners that are using Hypothesis really all over the world. So you can take a look at some great resources that have been shared, um, even could be from some of your colleagues. Um, and then you can take a look at some examples of classroom use if you're still in that um, stage of uh, getting started with using the tool and not sure exactly what you want your annotation assignments to look like. So some great resources for you to come back to. These are all active links. So um, the slide deck will be your go-to place. Um, so as I mentioned, today's workshop primarily is focused on creative ways to use social annotation in your courses. Um, so we won't be going into the step-by-step -step of how to create a hypothesis-enabled reading in your course. If that's the journey, um, that's where you're at in your journey of using hypothesis, um, our team would be happy to, um, to help support you in getting started. I have um, linked here all of our LMS-specific resources. Um, so you have those to come back to. Um, our team's also happy to meet with you. So if you're like, hey, I'm using um, Moodle, I don't know how to get started. Um, we can share some resources with you and our team would be happy to uh, work with you uh, to get started on that. Um, I am gonna just put our success email address in the chat. It's also in the slide deck. Um, so you have that to come back to as well. Just out of curiosity, um, there's some some names and, and faces, I suppose, that I know in today's session, um, but I don't know all of your institutions. So I'm gonna just throw a little poll at you today um, to learn a little bit about who we have joined us, what LMS, so um, a poll's coming your way of what LMS you use at your institution. And of course, this, if other is your, if other is your answer, you're welcome to throw um, in the chat what LMS your school uses. Great. It looks like almost everyone has had a chance uh, to answer. Got it. Katie's, Katie's using both Brightspace and Canvas. Thanks for sharing that, Katie, in the chat. Um, I'll just throw the results up here in case you're curious. We have no Blackboard users in here. Um, some Canvas, Bright, D2L Brightspace, Bright Space, uh, Moodle, and Sakai. So a good mix. Um, so that's always nice to see. Great. Um, so we'll be talking about some active learning strategies, um, some discussion protocols, a variety of different um, strategies that you can use with Hypothesis. Um, by no means are, is this an exhaustive list, um, and by no means are these uh, strategies that can just be used with Hypothesis. So I may share some ideas that you're like, oh, I've already used that before, didn't think to use it with Hypothesis. Um, so these are just um, strategies that can be used um, in a social annotation format. So hopefully we'll give you um, some ideas for how to, to get started or how to expand your use of Hypothesis in your courses. Um, I do always say, you know, I'm gonna share a lot of ideas. Um, don't feel overwhelmed by it. Choose one that stands out to you um, and walk away from today's session and give that a go with your students. See how it goes. Um, try it with another course, see how that goes. Um, so um, hopefully um, you won't be uh, too overwhelmed um, with the ideas that are shared. Um, so I'll um, kick things off. Now I know we have a few um, new users, but I am just curious, I'm gonna actually send another poll your way. Um, and this poll, I just wanna know how you've used Hypothesis, if you've used it before, or if you haven't used Hypothesis, how are you hoping to use it? So sending that poll your way now. And again, I know not everyone has used Hypothesis, um, but if you have used it, you can answer accordingly. And then of course, if you're hoping to use it, you wanna share a little bit about how you're hoping to use it. And if there's any context you wanna throw in the chat that you think would be useful for our team to hear about or, 
um, your peers in today's session, feel free to throw that in the chat as well. Right. Um, by no means is this also an exhaustive list of ways, you know, that it's really can be endless, the ways that we've seen um, instructors use the tool. And I'm sure there's ways that hypothesis is being used for social annotation that we haven't even yet heard of. Um, so, of course, if you have a neat idea or something that's worked really well for your students um, and um, your course readings, feel free to throw that in the chat. I'm sure everyone in today's session would appreciate hearing that, but it does look like three out of five of you did say instructor guided reading. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah, great context. Awesome. So let's jump right in and start talk, talking about uh, those some discussion protocols, some active learning strategies that you can use with the tool. You could be very explicit about um, having your students ask specific types of questions in the text. Um, so you could, um, perhaps students are responsible for asking one type of each question. Uh, so they may be asking, each student needs to ask a level one question that's particularly text-based. They also have to ask a level two question and a level three question throughout the text. Um, you could have your students tag their annotations. Is anyone using tags in their annotations if you're a, a current user? Um, I can go ahead and, and throw a resource in the chat about using tags. So you have that if you're not yet using it. Uh, we have a quick tutorial that you can take a look at and also share with your students. So tags can be a great way to categorize or organize your annotations. If students are, identi are identifying three types of questions that they have, they may be tagging their annotations with those types of questions. So then it's easier for you as an instructor or even for students to filter through the questions and see, oh, here are all the level one questions. Here are all my level two questions coming up. You can make comparisons between those questions or even have a student facilitator um, that helps work through and brings up those those various questions or summarizes some of those questions and I um, and uses those in a class discussion. Or the next step for your students could be to go back in and try to answer each other's questions. So the first step in their initial read is to ask all of their questions. The second step could be for students to go back in and, and try to attempt to answer each other's questions. Um, and I'm going to go through some other um, active learning strategies as well. Um, note that the description for each of these is in the notes of the slide deck. So if you're like me and trying to frantically write these down, don't worry about that. You have a place that describes them in the slide deck. Um, so no need to memorize any of these. And some of these may be ones you're familiar with, um, but just never thought to use them with social annotation. Um, so you could do a write, pair, share. Um, perhaps you even spend a few minutes in class, you um, have students write out their own individual annotations, then pair students up, have them discuss their annotations. They could even go back and edit their annotations to expand their thinking based on what their peers shared with them. Um, and then those become whole class ideas. So by sharing annotations, that could either be just visible to everyone in the course um, by posting their annotations, or it could become uh, uh, the guiding statements for what's to come next in the class discussion to point out various annotations um, that need to be shared um, with the entire course verbally uh, versus just having those annotations always live on top of the text. Uh, you can make annotations of a large assignment, have it be um, quite an exhaustive experience, um, a time consuming one, or you could just make it a quick experience, like a one minute annotation. Give students a minute or a little bit more if you choose and have students write a brief summary of the text or identify the most important or critical components of the text, their key takeaways. So just give them a few, a minute or so to reflect and identify those in their annotations. Doesn't have to be, you know, their, their perfect summary or a perfect description of the text, but give you a quick snapshot of how students are responding to the text. 
Uh, jigsaw may be one that you've heard of before, um, but the jigsaw method is where your students are divided up into several groups. Each group is responsible for a unique reading. So each group is responsible for a unique reading. They become experts on that reading. So um, group one could become experts, annotate together on their text, group two, and so on. Um, and then the reason why it's called a jigsaw is um, the students then all come back together and they pull the pieces together from each other. So the experts on article A um, uh, share their expertise with um, the group that annotated article B and so on. So you could some come up with some sort of collaborative learning environment where students may not be expected to read every single article you assign them, but there's some peer teaching and learning happening with the jigsaw method. Uh, the next one, sometimes called final word, sometimes called save the last word. It'll make sense once I explain it. And that's um, students are working in groups um, and one student selects a quote from the text and annotates it. They don't say why they selected it though. Um, then the students in their group take turns responding to that initial annotation, explaining why they think the student selected that quote. And then the reason it's called save the last word is that original student closes the discussion with a reflection in a way almost confirming or denying if their peers were on the right track um, of why they think they selected that quote. Uh, four A's could be quite a, quite a lot of different things. Um, it could be students are discussing, so they're creating four annotations. One of those is where they're discussing an assumption. One of those is where they're um, identifying parts of the text that they agree with. One of those could be a part of the text that they argue with. And one of those could be a part of, part of the text that they aspire to. Uh, but of course, you could choose to customize those A's and change them to really fit, fit the needs of your course. Uh, three, two, one could also be quite a different, a few different things, but I've commonly seen it um, three things that students have learned. So they're maybe identifying, creating three annotations of uh, parts of the text that are new to them, uh, two parts of the text that have confirmed what they already knew, and one question that they still have. So in total, they'd be creating um, six annotations. They could even um, tag their annotations with learned, confirmed, and question. It's easy then to identify, oh, here's, here's where students have um, questions about the text. Uh, this is maybe an area that quite a few students already knew about um, this topic. Uh, as I said, three, two, one could also be a few other things. It could be they're identifying three differences in the text, two similarities, one question, if you're having them make comparisons, um, or even um, three of the most important ideas, two supporting details, one question. So you have lots of different options there, and I'm sure you'll you can even come up with your own. Uh, and then sit is as it's written here, students would create three annotations, one where they're um, identifying something that's surprising for them in the text, one that's particularly interesting, um, one that's troubling. This is also a great use case for tags as well. And just a reminder, as you're in today's session, if you do have any questions, uh, feel free, you can throw those in the chat today. We'd be happy to, to help tackle those. Uh, you can also be really explicit about the kinds of connections that students are making with the text. Um, so here's just some examples. Um, perhaps you're requiring students um, making uh, text to self connections, text to text, text to world, and text to media connections. They could tag their annotations with those as well. Um, Laura, there's actually a great resource and I'd be happy to stick around at the end of the session um, and show you what it looks like to create a tag in an annotation. I believe if you take a look at the tutorial as well that's linked right before your question, there should be, um, um, I wanna say it's a, a GIF of, of creating tags. So you can take a look at that, but I'd also be happy to stick around um, towards the end of the session and show you um, what it looks like to add tags to annotations. Great question. 
Um, these sorts of connections can also be a great way to have students add supplemental resources to their annotations, have them use multimedia in their annotations. If they're making connections to another text, perhaps they're linking to that text. Or if they're connecting to a real world example, they're linking to where they've learned about or can learn more about that example um, as well. So um, great way to force students to make those various types of connections to help them better understand the text. Um, the next several slides talk about visible thinking strategies or routines. Um, this comes from Harvard Project Zero's visible thinking routines, and I'll put a link to that in the chat. Um, they have quite an exhaustive list <laughs> of thinking routines, so I'm sure if none of these quite work for your course, um, you'll find some others that work um, and make sense for the types of readings you're doing with students. Um, but I did just pull a few out um, that work well with annotations. Uh, so this compass points one, I've frequently recommended that when um, using annotations with the syllabus. So if you have your students annotate your syllabus or your course outline, uh, this compass point thinking routine can be a great activity uh, where students are identifying and creating four annotations. One thing that they need to know more about in your course one thing that excites them about your course. Uh, the S could be maybe a, a suggestion or even something that surprises them about your course. Um, and then the W um, is a worry that they have. Of course, you could do this with an article that's relevant to them or one that's perhaps particularly controversial somewhere where you want to create that community with students, um, have them share their personal opinion, but be explicit about how they're sharing their opinion. Um, or what areas um, they may be sharing on. Uh, this next one seem, may seem a bit elementary, but sometimes students may need that support depending on um, the level of your students, how familiar they are, having conversations on top of text, having um, reflecting on their thinking as well. Um, so even just having them create one final annotation uh, where they select the part of the text that changed their thinking. And then they can um, identify what they used to think. And now because of the, um, the reading, they now think something different. So giving them a space to um, reflect on how their thinking has changed. Headline can be a bit of a, a fun one as a way to have students reflect and synthesize what they identify as the headline of the text. I imagine frequently the text that you're giving students have a, a title, a headline of some kind, um, but have students come up with it. So that's their final annotation. It could be having students identify what the headline is. What are those key takeaways? What are those must knows? Um, and what would, and it, they could even be creative in how they're coming up with that. So as if they were changing um, the newspaper article, what would they want to identify as the headline? Color, symbol, and image can be a great way, another great way to have students incorporate multimedia into their annotations. So students could either choose a color, symbol, or image, or perhaps students are required to do all three. They identify and add a color, a symbol, and an image that best represents the essence of the text. And then of course, they'd be explaining um, why they selected that color, symbol, and image. Uh, you can give students roles, various roles in their annotations. Um, you could uh, switch up those roles <coughs> on particular readings. They may have one role. Um, different groups may have specific roles or tasks as well. Uh, here are just some ideas. Um, you, I imagine students are frequently responding to annotations from their own perspective. They're writing in their own voice. But why not have students impersonate, take on the role the character of someone else, have them practice that skill of thinking from someone else's perspective, writing from someone else's perspective. Um, so here are just some examples. You can have students um, be the voice of a historical figure, a scholar, a famous person, someone who's a critic of the topic, um, someone who might have a controversial opinion. And again, having them practice, practice that skill of thinking of others' perspectives and how they may read the article um, from their own voice rather than you know the student voice that they're typically um, responding from. 
Uh, I mentioned you can use um, unique roles in groups. So you could choose to alternate these roles um, or have certain groups focus on certain tasks. So you could have a group that really just focuses on asking questions throughout the text. Um, you could have someone that's in there pushing the thinking of the group, helping expand the thinking, um, almost playing the, you know, the devil's advocate, as they say in there. You could have one group or one student who's responsible for adding multimedia to extend the thinking, have that reading come to life, add those supplemental resources. Um, and then you could have, um, you know, student or a group really be responsible for making those connections between what's coming up in annotations and the text or even other, um, other forms of connections as well. Um, obviously some other roles you could consider is a spokesperson, checker, a reflector, a recorder. Um, in a meeting that um, my colleague and I had with an instructor yesterday, we talked about maybe having an, a historian role. So someone's role is really just about making those historical connections, um, a researcher role. Um, so the ideas are kind of endless there, um, but coming up with roles that um, align with what you're hoping students to um, take on in the, in the text. Uh, these are a bit of a fun one. Um, so annotating like social media doesn't mean your students are using social media, um, but they're annotating as if it's social media. Um, so students aren't actually creating a tweet on Twitter. They're creating an annotation that's like a tweet. They may be more familiar with social media. Reality is they're going to use probably social media in the real world. They may even use social media in a professional scenario in the future. Um, so why not have them practice writing from a different in a different format, one that may excite them, one that they may be more accustomed to, or maybe even one that they need to practice. <laughs> so with um, creating an annotation like a tweet, you're limiting the characters. Um, you could even have students add tags, like hashtags with Twitter. If you're having um, you know, a conversation, um, a, Twitter, uh, a Twitter thread, what would be coming up? How would they respond to each other? What would their tweets look like? Um, TikTok's one I'm not super familiar with, but you could have students create short form videos of themselves responding to the text or answering a certain discussion prompt in the text. Um, my understanding is TikTok videos are limited to 15 to 60 seconds, so they get a quick snapshot of them responding. You could use a tool like Flipgrid or another where students are filming themselves and then just adding that shareable link uh, to their annotation. Um, they could create a annotation that's like an Instagram post. So they could imagine that they're a character, an author. What would they post in their Instagram post? Um, it can include an image, a caption, and then a hashtag, or in this case, a tag as well. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer feedback can also be a, a way to use hypothesis um, on social annotation. I do want to preface this by saying um, that the way Hypothesis works as an external tool in your LMS means that only you as an instructor are able to create Hypothesis-enabled readings in your course. So if students are submitting their own work to you, you would still have to be the one that sets that up as a Hypothesis-enabled reading. So just something to keep in mind, um, I've seen peer-to-peer -peer feedback practice on exemplars or even non-examples as well. So maybe you have another format for how students give peer-to-peer -peer feedback um, in your course. Maybe your LMS has something specific that you use, um, but perhaps you're practicing feedback with an exemplar or a sample assignment. If you of course have permission to share that, um, what did the students do really well? What area do they need to improve on? I even worked with an instructor who had um, students give him feedback on um on his dissertation um so again a way for them to practice in real life on um, a relevant topic and material you could be explicit about giving students a protocol for giving feedback so here's just one example the tag feedback protocol um, so students would be creating three annotations um, one where they tell them um, something positive what you know what did they connect with what really wowed them um, one annotation that's a question uh, to dig a little bit deeper into what the, the student meant in their writing. 
Um, and then the last annotation would be giving students a suggestion. Or you could keep it super simple and three annotations. What went well? What didn't go well? What would you change? So what recommendation would you have for students? Um, and they can even tag their annotations with these symbols as well. So then it's easy for students to identify, oh, here's the areas where um, this, this writing, um, I have some positives that came out of this. This might be an area where I need to improve on and so on. And I just have some fun ones to leave with you today. Um, so just some ideas, some of these have already come up a little, a little bit, um, but have students keep track of something silly, like a particular word, how many times an, um, the author uses it. While that may seem silly initially, it can be a great way to start a conversation about word choice, why that word was used, um, why is that relevant in this text? Um, students can come up with a secret code for annotating. Um, there is a way to add emojis to annotations. So students could, you and students could come up with a code for emojis um, as a way to respond to each other or have different meanings in their annotations. Um, encouraging students to add those supplemental resources, add videos that further expand their thinking um, or images that help represent the themes or the concepts that are coming up in a text. Um, you could turn it into a scavenger hunt as well, where students are identifying specific elements of the text um, as just a way um, to, to make it a little more fun for them. I know I've done a ton of talking on my end, um, and I'm just over that 30 minute mark. So hopefully um, you're OK sticking around with me um, today. Um, but I'd be curious to hear from you. Um, and if you want to just throw it in the chat today, think about the readings you assign your students, maybe the easiest reading you assign your students, the most challenging reading you assign your students. Um, what could that annotation assignment look like? What directions might you give them? What guidelines? Is there a specific strategy that you're like, oh, this would really work? Um, so I'll give you a little bit of think time. Um, I know I am putting you on the spot, but as you think of it, if you want to go ahead um, and share that in the chat today. And while I'm giving you some think time, I did, I'm going to just talk a little bit more on Colin's question that came up in the chat about using hypothesis with groups. I'm also going to put a resource that we have about using hypothesis with small groups that touches on all of our different LMSs. Uh, we also have a workshop that focuses specifically on using hypothesis with small groups. Um, so the resource is in the chat now. Um, if you do have Canvas or Blackboard as your LMS, know that we do work with Canvas group sets and Blackboard group sets. So know that you have the option. Um, long term, we're hoping to work with all of our LMSs um, and their group sets, um, but currently only Canvas groups and Blackboard groups is available. Uh, for those of you using the other LMSs, Sakai, Moodle, DQL, and so on, um, you do have to create um, PDFs with unique fingerprints if you want to split students up into smaller reading groups. Another idea would be to use tags. So if you have students, perhaps if you have a longer text, you could split students up in a group. They're all annotating the same document together, but different groups either have different roles or different groups focus on different sections of the text. So perhaps group one is focused on uh, pages one and two. 
So rather than having 15 students annotate pages one and two, you may only have three. Um, so divide up the text that way is one way to do it. Um, so that obviously works for both smaller courses and some of those larger classes as well. Um, I think probably small groups makes the most sense when you have shorter pieces of text. So if you have a short poem, a one page document that students are reading, you have a larger class, it may make sense in that instance to split your students up into smaller reading groups so that it doesn't become annotation overload as Colin, as Colin referred to it in the chat. I'd be curious to hear if anyone has any ideas or if one particular strategy stood out to you as one that you're, you're willing or maybe excited to give a go with in your course. And if not, no pressure today. If you do decide um, to try out one of these strategies, we'd love to hear how it goes. If you need any support, our team's here to support you with that as well. I did just wanna wrap up um, today's conversation with that, talking about support. What support is available for you and your colleagues using Hypothesis uh, this academic year? Um, so know first off that you're not alone. Um, if you have incredible vision, you may be able to spot your school's um, logo on this page, although I can't promise that every single logo of the schools we work with is listed here, but quite a few of them are. So know that you're not alone. There's um, quite a variety of schools, disciplines, um, using the tool really across the world. Um, and you're not alone in the support as well. Um, so we're so glad that you joined today's session, um, but this doesn't have to be the end of our conversation um, about hypothesis, about using hypothesis specifically in your courses. In terms of technical support, we have um, our knowledge base. You can link out to all of our Help Center articles there. If you or your students ever run into any technical issues, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I do just encourage you to reach out via your school email address. We then know, okay, we know what LMS you're on. We also, because you're partnered with us, we do also put um, you in the front of our line. Um, so you'll, our, you'll be first to hear from us. Um, and then in terms of pedagogical and implementation support, we have some guides for using Hypothesis. You're always welcome to set up a one-on-one -on -one with um, our success team to dig further into how you might use it in your course. Um, we're also happy to always offer these sorts of sessions for your institution, for your department, for your colleagues. So if you think they'd be interested in learning more, feel free to reach out. I do encourage you to check out our Liquid Margins show. It's a podcast style video show we host um, about once a month um, on pedagogical approaches for using the tool. So you can take a look at past episodes for some inspiration and resources. Um, and then I I did already talk about our upcoming partner workshop, so we'd love to see you and or your colleagues on any of our upcoming sessions. Um, and then I will just go ahead and um, leave our email address here. Um, I know my team and I are happy to stick around and answer any questions you have, um, but I can only imagine how incredibly busy you are this fall. So if you do need to, to hop off, um, feel free to do so and enjoy the rest of your week.